If you have a Bible this morning, turn with me, if you would, please, to Genesis chapter 22. As we look at a particular season of the man Abraham's life, his son Isaac is older now. Isaac miraculously born to Abraham and Sarah after their childbearing years. The only biological son of Abraham and Sarah. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. To test is to examine, to put a force upon something put a a, a heat applied, whether spiritual or actual, to reveal what is actually there beyond what is visible. You think about it in terms of gold or some kind of metal or ore in the ground. In its natural state, it is often diluted and polluted with other elements and other material mixed in with it. And the only way to get the purity of the metal or whatever you're desiring to see out of it is to apply significant heat, dissolve away that which does not belong or that which covers it and is mixed with it, melt it away so only the gold, only the metal that you were looking for is to be revealed. That is the kind of testing that God is placing upon Abraham in this story. Sometimes he puts that type of fire to our life. What is he testing in Abraham? Maybe you. He is first of all checking his heart. He tests his heart. It says in verse 2 that the Lord said, take now your son, your only son whom you love. And that's okay. He loves his son. So he comes to the place, the Lord, he comes to the place where Abraham's heart is so invested. He said, would you allow me to have your son? Would you allow me access to this place? Do I have more of your heart than he does? The Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? What is the, the biggest and most important one you know, that I should know about? And Jesus responded to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. To love him. We don't know if that's true until certain tests come upon our lives. We want to believe that and we want to assert that. I love the Lord with all my heart, we say. We are devoted to him. We believe. But how do you know? This test was put upon a a young man in the New Testament. Look at the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19. I'll come back to Genesis. A young man, he comes up to Jesus, says another Gospel, says he came running up. He'd heard some things about Jesus, maybe. 
Maybe you've heard some things about Jesus, certainly. Doesn't mean you truly have surrendered or truly believe or have given of your life and your heart to him, but you've heard some things. This man had heard some things. And he comes up to Jesus and he asks a classic question that is still in the hearts of many people today. He said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? We learn about this man that he has a lot already in life, in the physical. He has money, he has status, he has youth and strength and health and who knows what else, possessions. But there was something wrong. And he knew, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm uncertain as to whether or not I have eternal life, meaning that his sin was cleansed and washed away, and upon leaving this life and entering to the next, he would be accepted, cleansed, and forgiven in the holy presence of Almighty God, his maker. So what must I do? What good things should I do? People want to know that now. That's why a lot of times I do I have to outbalance the bad with the good in my life. I'm going to start being nicer to people because I want to be a good person in the hopes that God will accept me. And so he thinks there is something he can do. And so Jesus begins to examine this man, to put a test upon him, upon his heart. And he said, have you kept the commandments? And the man said, well, which ones? And Jesus only references commandments that have to do with his earthly morality. It's not all the commandments, but it's some. And he says, well, like you shall not commit murder and you shall not commit adultery and steal and bear false witness and honor your father and mother. And what he's saying is, do you believe that you're a good person? And the man does. Of course, Jesus is walking him down a path. And he says, look at verse 20. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? A lot of people, they can't figure out why they feel at times that shadow in the background of their life. That every now and then, this feeling of a hollow, empty place creeps in upon their life. Maybe somebody's sitting here listening somewhere now. And this man couldn't figure it out. What am I still lacking? And like him, a lot of people would say, I don't understand, I'm a good person. And he was, by society's measure, he is a good person. People may say, I have a decent amount of health. I look around and people are going through so many storms and by some protection from God. I have not had that in my life. My family's not that crazy, you know, and I see these people, these crazy families, and you say, I don't have a crazy family, and my marriage is pretty good, and my job is pretty good, and my bank account's stable. But just like this man, there's that question, and we distract from it, and our society offers us so many things to distract our attention away, but there are those moments that sneak in on us, riding in the car, laying in bed at night. What am I still lacking? This is what Jesus wanted him to ask. Jesus said in verse 21, if you wish to be complete. So many people, they go through life, but they are not a whole person and they know it and they've tried to fix it and they can't fix it. Go and sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. You'll have what you're looking for. You'll have eternal life and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving. He was sad for he was one who owned much property. Couldn't do it. What did he do? He put a test on his heart. It wasn't about Hey, if you want to go to heaven, you got to sell everything and give to the poor, and that's the secret path. That wasn't the point. The point was he revealed his own heart to him. If you want to come follow me, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Well, how do you know? What if you sold all this stuff you have and gave it to the poor and came and followed me? Can I ask for that? Would you do it? The answer was no. No, I won't give you my heart. 
That was his test, and it revealed what was really there. How bad did you want to know what you had to do to receive eternal life? You just need to give of yourself. You need to surrender your whole life to him. It's not about a material thing. It's about a spiritual thing. And he wouldn't do it. So great. Just a few minutes ago, a young woman caught me in the aisle. She said, I've never told you this story. She said, some time ago, you were going around talking to people and I was there and I was talking to my friend and you talked to my friend and you looked at me and you asked me if I was a Christian. And she said, I said to you, yes, I was, but I wasn't. I said, okay. And she said, but I just wanted to tell you that the next week I gave my heart to Jesus and I am a Christian. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, said, I told her, I said, this is the greatest story I've heard all morning. Give your heart to the king. Then when you become a Christian, does he have you? Does he have, can he ask for you? Come, follow me, he said. Would you follow me? Let it go and come and follow me. And that means things sometimes. And people, listen, they will follow him on a Sunday morning. We give percentages of ourselves to God. They'll follow him for an hour. And I, I'm not here to begrudge your attendance or guilt trip. There, that's not real anyway. If you do things out of guilt, he wants it out of love. But we give things for an hour or we'll give our devotional time or we'll give five minutes of a prayer in the car. We, we give percent. Lord, you can have this part and that part and a little bit of money, a little bit of stuff, a little bit of effort. Here you go. Can he ask for your whole future? Hey, you had this plan in your life and you had this picture of where you were going. Give it all to me. Throw that away. I have a different one. Come, follow me. Can he have that? Many people, they would go away sad like this man. No, he can't have that. Can he ask you to go anywhere, to live anywhere? Hey, you had envisioned yourself always living here or there, but I've called you here. Would you go there? Can he ask for the relationship that you hope turns into a marriage with this person you've begun a relationship with? Can he come along and speak to your heart and not have to explain himself in the moment and say, let that go, that's not for you. I want you to come follow me. I have something different. Oh, it's so hard. The Bible says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind. He said to his people in the Old Testament, the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness, testing you to know what was in your heart. Tested Abraham's heart. Genesis 22, what else? He was testing Abraham's faith. Trust. Verse two, he said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. The Bible says in Hebrews that faith is the substance or the evidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. If we only have faith in what we can see and understand and accurately predict, that's not faith. Faith is the substance. People say they have faith, but there's no substance there. The minute it crosses the red line of what you cannot know and cannot control, but yet God has called you to trust him for that place, whatever is left of your faith, then that's the substance of your faith. That you trust that he knows something you don't. That he can take you a place you cannot yet see, but yet you've been called to follow. He was testing, will you come? Will you bring your son, your only son? He doesn't, know, he doesn't have an understanding. He doesn't know why. What will happen? Is this really gonna go this way? What, what's going on? He doesn't give those answers. He's asked for trust. He's asked for his faith and his surrender. The Bible says the proof of your faith, though tested by fire, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, the Bible says, what did he believe? Where, what was his faith in that he could get on that donkey, take his son, and go up the mountain with these instructions? 
says when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Why? Hebrews says, Abraham considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead. So he knew this might happen. I may offer my son on Mount Moriah, but if God has said it, then God can raise him from the dead if he wants to, and I trust him for what I do not know. The Bible acknowledges this so many times. Those verses we often quote maybe. Trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then the Bible knows where our mind goes next. Isn't it funny the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Because your mind will mess with where your heart's trying to go. And the reverse can happen. He says, so trust in the Lord with all your heart. And then he says, lean not to your own understanding because what you're gonna do when you try to trust with your heart, your mind's gonna go, well, that doesn't make any sense. So then he says, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Acknowledge him for what you can't grasp. You don't know in the moment what he's doing or why he's doing it. It's easy to have faith when those miraculous fireworks are going off in your life. And there are seasons like that. Praise God for them. The Bible talks in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus comes to Peter's house. And it says his mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law, is sick in bed. And Jesus comes up and it says he touches her hand and she sits up. Cured instantaneously of her infirmity. She sits up and she has been made well. Right after it, it says, and many were coming and bringing to him those who were demon-possessed, captured by the darkness, afflicted by evil and demonic power in their mind, in their body, their strength, whatever. And it says Jesus was casting those demonic entities out with a word. He was just speaking to it and it would leave and people would be found made well and in their right mind and set free from the grips and the chains of evil. Well, it's easy to praise God then, isn't it? They were witnessing it with their own eyes. If you'd have asked Peter right then, hey, do you, do you have faith now? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Praise the Lord. Yes, I do. So, you know, a demonic power goes out of a person. Do you have faith that he is who he says he is now? Yes, I do. It's easy when you prayed to be healed and God healed your body. Do you have faith now? Those miraculous moments where the veil between heaven and earth gets so thin, you're not sure where you are anymore. It wouldn't be long later. Right after that, same story, right after that, Jesus says, come follow me. And they do, of course they do. He just cured his mother-in-law and set people free miraculously. He said, well, come follow me. We're gonna go to the other side of the sea. And they get on a boat and they begin to cross the sea and the wind and the waves and the storm comes and the boat is rocking and Jesus is downstairs and the boat is asleep. And they said, Lord, do you not even care that we are perishing? You're not perishing. He said you were going to the other side, but in one turn of events, you don't believe it anymore. And he said, you of little faith, why'd you doubt me? You know, when he heals us or someone you pray for or provides for some need in your life and answers so specifically, you can say, praise God, man, my faith has been made stronger and I hope it has and that's true and those moments are great, those mountaintop moments with God. But do you still trust with all your heart when he did not stop that tragedy from crashing into your life. He could have, and he did not. Do you trust in the Lord with all your heart then? When your faith starts to shake a little bit, Somebody prayed for the right person that God would arrange a godly spouse and he crossed your path and you met that man, you met that woman. The wedding was so great. Your marriage is great. 
and you praise the Lord. Thank you, God, for this person. Thank you for this life. Is he still God when you can't have a baby? Do you still trust him? Rachel, Jacob's wife, she could not conceive a child when he took her as his wife and she came to her husband and she was upset. Understandably, she was broken. And Jacob said, am I the Lord? Am I in God's place that I open and close the womb? And he is acknowledging if God wanted you to, you could. And he hasn't. Do you trust him then? That's hard. Do you know all the reasons why it did or did not go a certain way? You do not. And you may never in this life. Is he still God in the tears, the anguish, and the mystery? The mystery, why, Lord? Why God? Is he still God when you stand at the cemetery with all kinds of questions that you know may never be answered in this life, this side of heaven. If he calls you again after that moment, would you trust him? Would you walk? Say, okay, Lord. That's where our faith really is. Whatever it is then. Verse three. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Jesus asked a question in the Gospel of Luke. Why do you call me Lord? And do not do what I say. What a question for our time. Why do you call me Lord? You don't do what I say. Abraham called him Lord. And that same Lord that miraculously brought about the birth of his son was now asking for his son. What did he do? He did what he said because God is really his Lord. It wasn't just something he said. It was who Abraham was. Surrendered to the Lord. He tested his obedience and he said, it says, he rose early in the morning. There was no delay. There was no contingency. There was no safety net, no backup plan. He got up early in the morning to do what God told him to do. Do you think he understood it all? Of course not. He trusted God for what he did not understand. Easier said than done, but it's what he did. And he was just as human as you and I. Years ago, I bungee jumped off a tower. I couldn't believe how thin that cord was they hooked up to me up there. I thought, is that, is that like the one? You know, I didn't say anything, but they hooked it up and I dove off this tower. At the bottom, they had this gigantic, like, circle of inflatable air landing pad. And I looked off that tower and I looked at that cord and I thought, well, if what I think could possibly happen with this little cord, at least I got that landing pad down there full of air and I, I think I'll be okay. So it took a little of the the terror away. It took a little of the concern to know that it wasn't just a cement parking lot. People will do a lot of things in obedience to God if they know they can have an air mattress of a backup plan somewhere. 
well, I'll, I'll follow the Lord, but what if it doesn't work out? You know, then, then what's, and people even ask, you know, people, brothers and sisters in Jesus seek counsel of one another. And they're like, I think God's calling me to do this. It's kind of crazy. Do you think I should do it? And they'll say, well, you need to have a backup plan. Nowhere do we see that in the scripture. Nowhere. What a human response to it. Well, as long as you have a backup, you got a backup plan, right? So what are we really saying? If God's not really God, and he's not really trustworthy, then at least you can trust yourself. The Bible leaves no room for such things. Luke chapter nine. People always running up wanting to follow Jesus. Still happens now. Lord, I want your direction for my life. I want your purpose for my life. I want to hear your voice. I want to do your work. I want to find your will. What is your will for me, God, we pray. And then sometimes he tells you. You're like, man, I, I'd like to inflate a landing pad just in case because I didn't expect it to be like that. Reminds me of these guys, Luke 9, 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. I've said it, many here have said it. Did we mean it? And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. You never heard from that guy again. All it took was sometimes we've got to sleep outside and you might not have a pillow. Oh, well, I, I didn't know that. I kind of just wanted the fireworks part. I like the walking on water story. I don't know about the no bed story. Never heard from him again. Verse 59, and he said to another, follow me. Hey, follow me. There's another, hey, come with me. And he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. And he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Always about first with people. I'll follow you, Lord, I will. I, I just, I, I gotta get married first before I fully surrender. I gotta have this education completed first. Everyone's got big promises to make to God. They'll go up Mount Moriah, they say, as long as I saved enough money and I have a backup plan, if you can guarantee me it's safe or once I retire, when I have more time, when my kids are older, but first... And then our obedience will come. It never does. Abraham, he saddled his donkey early in the morning. He took the wood, took his son, and he headed up the mountain. You know, some of us have long known what God is asking of your life. And we're still saying, but first, we're still waiting around. Whether it's to come to Jesus, like that young woman I talked about, Lord spoke to her heart one week, next week, She's a Christ follower. But someone, God's been speaking to you in the same way. You still haven't come all the way to Jesus. And here it is again. The Spirit of God is stirring and calling to your heart. And what are we going to say? I'll think about it later. Next week, tomorrow, next Sunday. I need to know more. I want to talk to somebody. Other people, you know the Lord and he's called you to do something. He's called you to go somewhere. He's called you to lay something down to follow him. And we say what? We make all kinds of excuses. You've already prayed about it, but you gotta pray about it. So I gotta pray about it, which is oftentimes an excuse to delay obedience. Yes, pray about it. Yes, fast. Yes, seek counsel. But there comes a time to get on the donkey and go or stop lying to yourself that you're ever gonna. It's time. And he went up the mountain. What are you gonna do? The Bible says he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. We obey the gospel and then we obey his will or we don't. Would you bow for prayer this morning? Somebody today, maybe here listening somewhere, you need to come to Jesus. That's what this was about this morning for you. You're like that young man. You say, what am I still lacking? And the Lord has again spoken the answer through the living power of his word and Holy Spirit. And there's nothing left to do but turn from sin, confess and believe in Jesus as Lord for salvation. The Bible says now is the accepting time and today is the day of salvation. Come to him by faith.
Some brother or sister in here, you know the Lord. But you got a Mount Moriah in front of you. Somebody's faith hanging by a thread. I wish I could have answered all the questions you had in your heart this morning as to why there were times that God seemed to show up in Red Sea parting miracles. And other times there were things he could have stopped or changed and he didn't. I wish I could tell you that. But what I can tell you is the Bible and all those examples that have gone before us, they know where you live now and they speak across time and space. Those inspired words, trust in the Lord with all your heart. My brother, sister, lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. One day we'll have the answers to some things. Might not be today, might not be tomorrow, but do you trust him? Does he have your heart, your faith? What's he asking? Why do you call me Lord? Do not do what I say. Heavenly Father, we pray for somebody now. I lift them up to you, Lord. I can, some way, some mysterious way, God, I can feel them in this room, but I don't know their name. But you do. Not only that, Lord, your word is declared. You know the number of the hairs on their head and the days that were ordained for them before there was yet one of them. You know every step they take, every burden of their heart. And you know the struggle of their spirit right now. I pray for somebody to be comforted in a storm somewhere with questions and concerns and frustration and pain on their heart. God, I pray that you would meet them right there in their seat. With this story of your servant Abraham, with the comforting still small voice of your Holy Spirit, meet them where they are right now, God. Assure them of your presence. that their faith would be the substance of things hoped for, that they would have a conviction about things not yet seen. God, I pray for somebody with a decision in front of them. Perhaps somebody that to go one direction would be pleasing to many people. And another direction, though it would disappoint so many, would be pleasing to you. They stand at the fork in the road. I pray they'd saddle their donkey today, God. And they would go. No more delay, no more but first. Give them courage, surrender, comfort in their obedience, God, that they would go, even if they have to go alone. God, we thank you for Jesus. I pray that someone would come to know you today for real. They would know more than your name. They would know you as Savior, Redeemer, that you would be their Lord. They would be made a new creation right now as they surrender their heart, their life, their past, their sin, their regrets, their shame, all to the cross upon which you died, shed your blood, paying the payment for our sin and declaring it finished and rising from the dead. I pray somebody would come to you today, God. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.